Sue? She's sick. Sue just went home. She was here. Yeah. She started feeling faint. She so, was having uh, an episode. Yeah. That recorded, is it? Yeah. She started looking faint. I don't know. I wasn't here when she... Yeah. We were just talking, and all of a sudden she just... Yeah, kind of... she turned white. Yeah. So, so we really took her home. I know she has a an appointment with her cardiologist tomorrow. Thank you. 
not dangerous as far as we can tell. So they're trying some medication on it because they're being so irregular, she gets really tired. Yeah. And she said uh, the medication that they're giving her is right now it's giving her a little bit of trouble. She almost passed out. Yeah, Joy has an irregular heartbeat and when it's real irregular, it slows her down. She looks real. She even looks tired. So, and then you know we, we about it's been a while that we prayed for uh, Shana Poole in uh, Clovis, a girl that went to the school that was uh, injured in a boating accident. She was hit in the head by a boat propeller, and uh, they've been they've started to post pictures of her in the hospital online, and she just she just seems to be uh, a shell of who she once was. She is alive, but she just is not alive. Yes? I've had three friends fall off the bow of the boat and get chewed up by a propeller. So it happened. I don't even know what I was looking for in, in the medical part of the internet, but I come across a photograph of a guy in an emergency room with the gashes across his back. shall make the court of the tabernacle, for the south side southward, 
There shall be hangings for the court of fine twined linen, a hundred cubits long for one side, and the pillars thereof shall be twenty, and their sockets twenty of copper. The hooks of the pillars and their fillets shall be of silver, and likewise for the north side and length there shall be hangings a hundred cubits long, and the pillars thereof twenty. And the sockets twenty of copper, the hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver. And for the breadth of the court on the west side shall be hangings of fifty cubits, their pillars ten, and their sockets ten. And the breadth of the court on the east side eastward shall be fifty cubits. That's the entry gate. The hangings for the one side of the gate shall be fifteen cubits. The pillars three, and the sockets three. And for the other side shall be the hangings of fifteen cubits, their pillars three, and their sockets three. And for the gate of the court shall be a screen of twenty cubits, of blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twined linen, the work of the weaver in colors, the pillars four, and the sockets four. All the pillars of the court round about shall be filleted with silver, the hooks of silver, and the sockets of copper. The length of the court shall be a hundred cubits, and the breadth fifty everywhere, and the height five cubits of fine twined linen, and the sockets of copper. All the instruments of the tabernacle and all the service thereof, and all the pins thereof, and all the pins of the court shall be of copper. Exodus chapter 27, verses 9 through 19. Okay, so that's just so we have a little bit of visualization as we as we speak about uh, tonight's lesson. And tonight we're going to begin with the idea of how the tabernacle uh, represents our approach to God, okay? And we're going to see how the uh, how there's a correlation between the way the tabernacle was built and looks and how we are going to approach God. Uh, the words of God to Moses were very specific about how his people were to approach him. You know, God's people had never really approached God. When they were, uh, when they were in uh, Egypt, they were slaves. They, they didn't have that opportunity. Uh, probably the first time that they began to uh, consider who God really was, uh, because they, as they were in uh, bondage for such a long time, 400 years, they, in many ways, uh, had forgot their their roots more or less, but during the Passover meal, which uh, where, where they there's a lot of symbolism, of course, in the Passover meal. I don't know if we're gonna we may try to do one here this uh, uh, this Easter, and uh, but during the Passover meal, and, and I don't know if we really understand, but, but I think the Passover meal was we got to hurry because. All around them, people were dying, people were yelling, screaming, uh, and they understood one thing, we got to get out of here. And remember, we've talked two or three times how God had prepared his people, how God had prepared, prepared the Egyptians, how everything had been put in order for them to leave. And I believe that as they sat down to eat the Passover meal, they understood it was time to go, and they started to really understand who God was, the uh, true majesty of God. Now, eventually, God did re reveal himself in his holiness at Mount Sinai, and that really scared his people. Uh, they were, I guess you could say they were almost horrified. Uh, and they became very aware that no man 
could approach God, except for at that time Moses was given access to God. He was the people's, uh, the, their leader, but God wanted them all to be, see, God wants, all, God always wanted his people to be what to the world? To be priest. He really wanted, he wanted his, he wanted his, uh, his chosen people to function as priests so that they could approach him and have an ongoing relationship with him, like a husband and a wife. So, God revealed to uh, His people a pattern of worship that's consistent with His holiness. And remember, whenever you consider approaching God, you have to consider His holiness. That's an important part of the concept. And all the while, uh, God, wanted it, well, God wanted to be able to give sinful man the opportunity to enter into his presence. Okay? Even though God is holy and cannot allow sin in his presence. And that's the way the tabernacle worship uh, picture is it was developed by God. God wanted to reveal all that was involved uh, through the blood sacrifice and atonement so that his people would become familiar with the process of approaching him. Eventually, uh, he would expect them to become knowledgeable of how to approach him through his son. But the, there's a lot of uh, illustrations here, what we've call, called uh, typology in, in this whole picture of the tabernacle. So God wanted to make sure his people were aware first of all, of their sin. Because sin cannot be allowed to enter into his presence. So when an Israelite recognized that he had sin in his life, and that that sin separated him from God, he needed to recognize that he needed to be forgiven. And if he wanted to be forgiven, at this time in history, what would an Israelite do? He would go to the tabernacle. That was the only way he could be forgiven. He had to go to the tabernacle. And so you've seen the tabernacle. The walls are seven and a half feet high. And as he approaches the tabernacle, you have this, uh, you have this, um, it's a uh, 100 feet by 50 feet, or you know, 100, 100, it's 450 cubits. Yeah. Uh, 150 by 75, yeah. And uh, it's all in white linen except the one entry gate. And the white linen uh, is there uh, for a purpose, uh, and, the, and the entry gate is there for a purpose very distinct in nature, very contrasting in nature. Uh, and the gate acts accentuated the idea that this is the only way you can get into my presence. In Psalm 84, which is a good psalm if you wanted to read it, 84 too, uh, but it, it, it has a lot of uh, richness to it in regards to the tabernacle and to uh, the, uh, the idea of God. It says, my, song, my soul longs, yes, even faints, it says, for the courts, that's the courtyard, Courts of the Lord, my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. And then further on in, 80, in 84, in the 10th verse, it says, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. One day with you is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. So, we're going to speak to this uh, typology that we've talked about two or three times. And remember, a typology, a type, we've defined as something that points to a future spiritual reality. These are things that represent future spiritual realities, the things in the tabernacle. And the white walls, the white linen curtains all around the sides and the back and part of the front speak to one thing. When you think white, you think righteousness. The, the white linen curtain
curtains all around speak to the righteousness that is of God in Christ. Uh, and that, see, righteousness is God's only standard. Uh, for you and I to enter into God's presence, we have to be righteous. If you're not righteous, you can't enter into His presence. But the problem is, is that we know what we've studied already in Romans 3.10, uh, that uh, we don't have that righteousness. What's it say in Romans 3.10? It says, there is none righteous, no, not one. No one has that level of righteousness. So this high wall, seven and a half feet high, of white linen, excluded the Israelite from God's presence because they didn't have what they needed to enter in. If they were to jump over that white linen wall, they wouldn't, they, they would, they would, I imagine, suffer death because they were not in a position entering that way to have the righteousness needed to enter into God's presence. So, uh, I'll use the word lucky. We're lucky, though, that what we don't possess naturally, righteousness, Christ possessed for us in abundance. And uh, He is able to take His righteousness and place it upon us. What do we call that? Imputation. He imputes His righteousness to us. That's one of those Bible uh, theology words that we really need to understand. And he, he does that, he imparts that, he imputes that to all who believe on him and receive him as, uh, as their Savior. So here's this white, white wooden uh, linen fence that tells us of the righteousness of God and it keeps men out. And Jesus Christ, really, if the word uh, describes him as the righteousness of God. And we've studied, it's funny how these two here we are in the tabernacle, and what I'm going to talk to you about here tonight is in a Sunday morning sermon. Uh, but that's the way God seems to work these lessons off in time. But we've studied that the law was given as a man, it, the law was given to us to show us what perfection looks like. Because for us to be righteous in the view of the law, we can't break any of the law, correct? So that is a view of what, the, it's the sum total of perfection. And anything short of that sum total of perfection is what? It's unrighteousness. Even, even uh, it's, the Word tells us that, uh, you know, if you, if you just commit one sin, you've broken all the law. So the law has a requirement of perfection to meet it. And we can't do that. So, God describes all of our righteousness, what we might consider to be righteous, is nothing but filthy rags to God. So, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, I didn't come to destroy that law. What did He come to do? He came to fulfill the law. And the idea of behind that fulfillment is, is that He came to uh, give us the ability to meet the requirements of the law, but only by and only through Him. When, when He was here, see, Jesus was a living example of a lawful life. Because Jesus fulfilled the law. He never sinned one, once. He lived the perfect life. And by dying for us and bearing our sins, He became our substitute. By which, remember, He made an exchange for us. Remember, Sunday morning we talked about, I read to you a, a quote from Martin Luther. Martin Luther says there's, a, there's a, an exchange that goes on at the, at the moment that we are justified. Uh, which is God, Jesus,
takes his righteousness and lays it on us, the sinner, and he absolves us, he removes all our sin because he's already died for it. So he has the right and the ability to remove our sin. That brings to mind a question. And I shouldn't ask it, but I will. I'll probably ask it again Sunday morning. The only thing is, is it confuses me whenever I think of it. But I still think of it all the time. Did Jesus Christ die for the sins of those that have rejected him? And will never accept him? Have you ever really thought about that? Would Jesus Christ... Have you ever really thought about that question? Have you really? I think about it, when, especially as I've been studying this section of Romans 8. I don't know if his father would allow him to die for those that rejected him. I really don't. Even though the word says that he came to save everyone. would be in 
instantly dead. It'd be like uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, those guys, they were all getting blown away by that ray that came out of the, the Ark of the Covenant. The judgment. See, what, what sits on, the, on top of the Ark? The cherubim. And what are they doing? They're looking in. Yeah. And they, they, don't, they don't look out. They're looking in, and they're, they're looking down towards the mercy seat. And what's sprinkled on the mercy seat? The blood. The blood of Christ. See, the cherubim are judged, in my mind, they are judgmental creatures. They are, uh, they, that's part of their function. Uh, see, man in all his unrighteousness has to approach God in a proper way or it doesn't work. That's why the tabernacle had those white lenses <coughs> around it. What, what, what was wrong? Uh, with uh, Cain. What was wrong with his, his sacrifice, his offering? No. Huh? No he, I believe he knew exactly what he was supposed to do, and he, wanted, he decided he had a better way. So his sacrifice was entirely uh, inappropriate. The law of God, listen, the law of God kills. And that's what we've been reading in, in Paul in, in Romans 8. The law is a killer. And it's, and it's not because it's bad. Because Paul tells us that the law is holy and good and righteous. But the, what's, what, is, what makes the law a killer is that it reveals man's sin. And man's revealed sin, the results of man's revealed sin is death, eternal death. So, the perfect man, Jesus Christ, having never said sin, was accepted as a sacrifice on our behalf so that we could receive the right, righteousness of God. We looked at Romans 5.19. It says, For as by one man's disobedience, who's the one man? Adam, the guy in there. By one man's action, Disobedient, it says many, it really means all, were made sinners. So also, by one man's, with a big M, obedience, many, it really means all, that will follow, that are obedient to him, were made righteous. Okay? A direct con comparison contrast. Now in the center of the east wall, and it was always facing east, there's a break in those white curtains, and that's the only way, authorized way, to enter into the tabernacle. And that is, if you think about it, that's John 14, 6. What does John 14, 6 allude to? I am the way, the truth, and the, way, the, truth, the life. How, 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 how might, uh, how, no one, no one comes to the Father except uh, through me. That's the east gate of the tabernacle. No one. It was known as the entrance gate. And as we said, it's not white. It's got these multicolors, purple, blue. Uh, and the other colors describe it as red, but it's more of a scarlet. And it's hung on these strong pillars. You saw those pillars. Uh, remember, there's tons of silver, tons of gold. Tons, they call it copper, it's bronze. Tons of bronze used in the construction of this portable structure that was moved about. That God, in the, in the daytime, what was he? He was, a, he was a cloud, and at night he was a pillar of fire. God dwelt with his people. That was the first worship center. That was really new life worship center right there. The very first one. And... Uh, so, the entrance gate clearly marked the way by that a, in a in, and it's okay. A sinner can enter in through the entry gate. That's what it's designed for. It's designed to get the sinner from the outside into the inside, into what was called the outer court. You saw the, the way things, uh, and if, when the sinner came in, he would, he would walk in and he would have one thing with it. Because if he didn't have something with him, there was no reason to enter in through the gate. He had to have a sacrifice. Okay? He had to be prepared uh, as he 
he entered to be properly uh, presented before God. And when he enters, when he enters into that, as he enters in, he's entering into, for lack of a better phrase, holy ground. There, the, God already, I believe, understands his intent, the intent of his heart. Uh, so that's the entry gate. Now later on, and it's not, it's not really a gate, it's a curtain. Later on we'll talk about two other gates, two other curtains. Exodus 27, 16 says, For the gate of the court shall be a screen, twenty cubits long, woven of uh, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine woven linen, made by a weaver. It'll have four pillars and four sockets. Uh, there's no cherubim on this outdoor screen. <coughs> the cherubim are only in the, uh, you know, with the ark. And I make that point because I want to talk a little bit about the cherubim who represent uh, righteousness, judgment, and they are really the executioners of a God's righteous judgment. Where are we introduced to cherubim in the Bible? Uh, Genesis 3. That's the first place in 322. I'll read it uh, through 24. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. What does he mean? Is that a bad thing? Well, what does he mean? How's he become like God? He does good things. He does. He's. He's. he's well, uh, good thing. And that's what it says. He has become like us to know good and evil. It says. And now, lest he put out his hand and also take of the tree of life and eat. What happens if he eats of the tree of life? He, he lives live. forever, but he, he loses. <laughs> He's going to live forever. He loses of the uh, blood of tongues. Yeah. Okay. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden, kicks him out, and he tells him, go out there and till that ground. And he drives him out, and what does he do? What's he place at the entry to the Garden of Eden? He places a cherub. And uh, he, uh, it says he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden in a flaming, flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And then uh, in Exodus, there's a description of how to make the cherubim. You make two cherubim of gold, hammered work you shall make at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one at each end, and you shall make them... Uh, at each end of the mercy seat, you know how it's repetitive. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another, and the face of the cherubim shall be towards the mercy seat. And what kind of faces do the cherubim have? Well, Revelation, it's sort of hard, but uh, Revelation talks about the four faces. Yeah. They have four faces. Now, if they have four faces, what face are, are they showing on the mercy seat? Human. They're showing their human face on the mercy seat. But in my, this is this is my my. I believe the cherubim represent the judgment of God, which is averted because okay, there's the mercy seat. The blood is sprinkled on the mercy seat, right? Which is really shed for us. What's underneath the mercy seat? The law. The law. And that blood equivalent, uh, neutralizes that law in our lives. Of, it really. You know, it, there's a passage in Peter which is really neat where he's talking about our salvation. And he says, Which salvation the angels desire to look into? And with the description of the Ark of the Covenant, the cherubim are looking dead. Yeah, they, they are actually. I think any accurate portrayal of them would have them looking, looking inward. They are, uh, Ezekiel 1 has a description of uh, cherubim. And it calls, uh, the, there's the first time I'm familiar with the four faces. Uh, a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. I think the, the four faces. And uh, so, there's, this, there's the entryway to get in. And uh, it's very different than everything else physically that's at the, that's, uh, that someone enter. Can you imagine if you were, let's say, why, why put the entry gate on the eastern side? <laughs> that's where our Lord's coming from. <laughs> that's where the 
sun comes up, it's where our Lord comes from. Uh, if, you, if we ever had the opportunity, I don't know. Uh, you know, the whole eastern side of the temple was covered in gold. And when the sun came up, it, it, it shot out these rays that were, that were visible for miles and miles and miles, they say. It was so, so magnificent. And I think uh, the beauty that you would see with that fine linen, uh, there on that eastern side, as the bright rays of the sun hit it, would be magnificent. And uh, and that's remember, I want us to emphasize the idea that's the only way you can get close to God. It's the single entrance to the entire tabernacle. No other way in. Whether you're a, 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 a shepherd in the field, or whether you're the high priest, you're only going to get in the tabernacle in one way. Uh, and uh, as a sinner, you can, you can enter in that way, but you've got to be, you've got to have a repentant heart. Uh, that's the point I was trying to make with the sacrifice. Any Israelite appro approaching the tabernacle, maybe he's got a, a sacrifice leading it on a rope or something, and a desiring atonement, as he entered into the, uh, into the, into the, the into the outer court, he would be confronted by the bronze altar. Okay, and uh, it says, uh, uh, "In that gate now, listen. They didn't close it off at night. At twelve o'clock, it was still open. That gate was never barred. No one was forbidden to enter. Uh, all they had to do." They had to make a decision to go in, just like it is today. No one is barred. All you've got to do is be willing to make a decision. And then uh, for a couple minutes, I just want to talk again. I want to re reiterate, reemphasize that that's the way it is for us. Jesus revealed himself as the only entrance to God. So the eastern gate really points towards Jesus. Every other way is, is barred because all those white curtains represent the righteousness of God. We can't enter over those curtains because we don't have the ability. We don't have the righteousness. So here on the eastern end of the, the complex is this beautiful gate. And outside the gate is encamped the tribe of Judah. What are, and what, what, are the, what is the tribe of Judah? They are the kingly tribe. And I believe by the time, this time in their history, there were uh, over 70,000, you know, they did these census and stuff. There was over 70,000 what they would consider to be able-bodied men, which meant men over, over the age of 20, because that was the fighting force. And so here's this huge tribe, uh, and the, the, they're the kingly tribe, and their name really uh, means to praise, and Jesus as the King uh, is, is represented by that gate, uh, is right there with him, and he's the, uh, how would you say, uh, he's Malak Yahweh, the Lord our King, you would say in Hebrew, Malak Yahweh, he's the Lord our King, and it's the, that would be, uh, I imagine that worship call went up countless times. Uh, and we will have the same opportunity because that's what will be on our lips one day our, as, we, as we worship our Savior. And I believe that beautiful gate really just shows us who Christ is. Because I think Christ is beautiful. I think Christ is beauty. And when we, when we actually behold who our Lord and Savior is, I think that he will be the personification of love. That we will see in him uh, love, no flaws, perfection, and uh, that love, that for us to live forever, we have to be given enough strength to live forever. And I believe our strength will be generated by the love Savior and Lord. He will be our, our strength. He will be our fortifier.
it will be our nourishment. That's what makes Paul the love of Christ and strength. Yeah, that's what makes me. That's go. right. That's what makes me. That's what makes me keep going day by day. Uh, in Revelation five five, it says, "But one of the elders, elders said to me, Do not weep." Speaking to John, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seven seals. Isaiah 44, 6 says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. And then even as you look at the tabernacle, you can go to the point of typology where you can give the cords, and I think I talked about some of this before. The cords are what held everything together, all the way around, such as the love of Christ. Uh, the love of Christ for a lost world uh, is what holds this world together up, in, up until uh, the time when the Spirit's withdrawn, and then, and then there will be nothing to hold these worlds together. The, the cores that attach the pins and the stakes that are gri driven into the soil, the, the, representing the burial of our Savior. And, uh, but once buried, of course, he rose again. So, I, wanna, I just want to take a quick look here. Mike's going to play a, another little piece. He's going to play the piece from Exodus. Uh, it's from uh, Exodus 27, 1 through 8, I believe that speaks to the altar. Because that's the first thing. You enter through that gate, and the first thing you're confronted with is this altar that's, uh, that Mike's going to show us here. going to, uh, as he enters through the gate, he's going to be confronted by this altar. And it's not a, it's not a small altar. That's it right there. And it's the same, it's, it's the same in length as the walls are high. It's seven and a half feet high.
example, and there's a reason for that, that this blood is shed, it's, it's so, so that we will understand what happened for us. Who, you read, most of you, I imagine, saw the Passion of Christ. Uh, that may have been a somewhat accurate portrayal of how much blood uh, Jesus lost in that in the, the beating, the whipping, the, the scourging that he that he uh, that he took. And see, without you, you enter into the tabernacle without you stopping at that altar. You're not going anywhere. You can't go any further. You have to have a sacrifice for us. It was our Savior who shed His blood. For the, for the Israelite back at this time, uh, there was His sacrifice that He brought with Him, which, uh, which the, the priest would, it, they actually called it in Hebrew, it's a reference to laying on their hands, which means grabbing it, and slicing its throat as a picture for us to see, see, I think God wanted His people, when they were there and witnessed this procedure, He wanted them to understand what sin really was. And, and, and that, that's a, that, that, that type of uh, technique, for lack of a better phrase, is a representation, and, and it's, it, it was done to make them incredibly aware of the awesomeness of their own sin. So I, don't, I think if anybody has a heart, you would hate to see an animal have its throat slit like that. Uh, so, and then there's the idea that blood is the payment of death, uh, payment for us. That death uh, is our payment so that we then uh, can have eternal life with our Father. It's only by that death, it was only by that sacrifice for the Israelite that they could be then declared clean, okay? And it's only by the death of Jesus Christ that then we can then be declared clean. The, the blood of the animal uh, in a type would cover... Uh, would cover for the sins of those people until God Himself sent a lamb, His Son, to cover for us. That blood covers for us and takes away, takes away the sins of the world, is what the, the Word tells us. So we'll stop there. I'm already, I think I already have like another 30 pages, 10 pages of notes on this lesson because uh, I've really been involved with it, so. But that's good. It means I'm ahead of schedule. Okay. Any thoughts? Any words? Anybody? That verse in Leviticus where it talks about, um, that, and you were talking about the sweet smell coming Is it one nine? Yeah. Um, I just thought about how, you know, offensive blood is to us, and I, when you thought about that animal, that everything being burned up, and yeah, I mean, yeah. you deal with blood all the time, you know, but but to God, that was, you know, the, the sweet smell and the blood of His Son, you know. And if I understand correctly, they slit the animal's throat and they just let the blood run on the ground, I believe. At least. At, put it on the board the altar. Of the altar. Well, but in, for the individual, I think they just. Because there was just a trench. Or, uh, yeah.